shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us. We are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. Good morning, brethren. Imagine for a moment being a member of the early church. There are not too many of you because, well, because of persecution, because the church is heavily persecuted, in fact, and some members of the church have even been executed. The future doesn't look very bright. It looks quite bleak. And you begin to question the very survival of the church. But then at some point, God tells you that one day a great multitude of people will be part of that church. That's great news, isn't it? Encouraging. But as encouraging as that is, there is much more, much more that God has revealed to us. Let's look at some of it in Revelation chapter 5, verses 11 to 14. Then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne and the living creatures and the elders and the number of them was myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands saying with a loud voice worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing and every created thing which is in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all things in them I heard saying to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and dominion forever and ever. And the four living creatures kept saying, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped. Now we find here, obviously, of course, the symbolic language of Revelation that we talked about last week. I would like to begin by clarifying the fact that we see here a great multitude of angels. But what are angels? Angels are created beings, ministering spirits. God created them to minister, to serve Him, and to carry out His work. They bring messages on behalf of God. They protect God's people. They are often sent to encourage and to guide in some cases even to bring punishment. They patrol the earth, we read in the Old Testament, and fight the forces of evil. But one of the things that we see here in the book of Revelation often referred to is that they praise God at all times. And we find here, for example, in this section, a great choir of angels being described. But let's look at it more in detail. Verse 11. Then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne and the living creatures and the elders, and the number of them was myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands. I don't need to explain too much. He was talking about many angels as it states uh, at the beginning of this verse. But a myriad, it would be interesting to, to know that in myriad, in ancient Greek, uh, meant 10,000, which at that time was the largest single number in the Greek language. So basically what God is saying here through the, the Apostle John is the maximum of the maximum, myriads of myriads, an incalculable number of angels. Then he talks about 
living creatures, the four living creatures as they are identified earlier in the book of Revelation. In fact, we read of them in Revelation chapter 4 and verse 8. And the four living creatures, each one of them having six wings, are full of eyes around them within, and day and night they do not cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God, the Almighty, who was and who is and who is to come. Now, Ezekiel and the chapter 4 of Revelation identify this four living creatures as the cherubim, um, a special rank of angels. Then there are the 24 elders. They are uh, described here as sitting on 24 thrones, wearing white garments and gold crowns. So the image seems to be pretty clear when we find the 24 elders mentioned in the book of Revelation because the image is an image of victory and endurance. Earlier in verse 9 in the same chapter, they're described as being redeemed. So it is a clear reference to the saints because only the saints are redeemed. And why 24? Well, that is a little less clear, but scholars seem to indicate that they're the heads of the Old Testament and New Testament churches combined. In other words, the heads of 12 tribes of Israel, as well as the 12 apostles in their representative roles, not necessarily individually or personally, but as they represent the 12 tribes and the church in general. But one thing and I don't want to miss before we go ahead is the staging of the scene that we find in this and previous chapters. We find the outer circle being with myriads and myriads of angels. Then we see the inner circle. When we see the saints, we, we see the church. And at the center, God and the Lamb. And I find that order to be particularly meaningful and important because it shows what we will be at the resurrection. God, of course, is the one who sits on the throne, the king of the kings, but next to him is the church, and on the outer part, the angels, and the myriads of angels. Well, let's go to verse 12. What are these angels doing? They're saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. Seems like a, a, a list, and it, it is. John heard the voice of the angels proclaiming the worthiness of the Lamb. The angels proclaimed seven things that the Lamb was worthy of. And again, we need to look at the symbolic language of the book of Revelation, and we find that seven is meaningful because in Scripture it represents completion and fullness. So here, God, through the Apostle John, is representing com the completion and the fullness of the Lamb's worthiness, the absolute fullness of His worthiness. But not as now... The worship. It starts with the four living creatures and the 24 elders, and is then joined by myriads of angels, and later on, as we will see, will be joined by the entire creation. Each of the terms used here in this worship, in this praise of God, is a equality or an attribute of God that is found in Christ. And one of the meanings of that is that he is worthy because Jesus Christ is God. Those attributes make him worthy. But in reality, only God is really worthy in that way. And so Jesus Christ, the Lamb, is identified as God himself. The first of those attributes is power. He's worthy 
to receive power. Power means strength, obviously. God is omnipotent and can fully carry out his purposes and his will. Look at it in Matthew 28, 18. And Jesus came up and spoke to them and said, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. All authority. And implied in that is all power that comes with that authority. The second item that is mentioned here, that the lamb is, uh, is worthy to receive, is riches. Now it's in reference to royal possessions. He owns, in fact, God owns everything that there is. And that is definitely more than enough to meet the needs of all creation. But look at Ephesians 2, 7 and see how God defines the riches. So that in the ages to come, he might show the surpassing riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. All too often when we think of riches, we, we think of material possessions. But here, Riches means a wealth of goodness and grace that God has. And now that that wealth of grace and the wealth of goodness is poured in Jesus Christ, who is worthy of it. The next one is wisdom. Wisdom is an attribute of God, of course. God, who is omniscient, knows all things all things about God, all things about heaven, all things about us. God knows all things. And God knows what is best for us as well, of course. The next term is might, which means strength, indicating that there is no obstacle that can stand against God or his plans. He can carry out his plan despite any opposition. And he speaks and when he speaks, it is. Look at Jude, the epistle of Jude in verses 24 and 25. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory, blameless with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. And indeed, amen. God is mighty. And Jesus Christ, the Lamb, is worthy of that. The next term is honor. A term used to describe God in many, in many passages of Scripture. And the respect due to Him. God Himself is eternal and sovereign and majesty. His majesty is infinite. The, he's a sustainer of all creation, of all that exists, and, and therefore is to be honored by all in that majesty with the honor that is due to him. But then we see here that the Lamb, Jesus Christ, is God because Jesus Christ is worthy of all this. Look at Philippians chapter 2. And verses 9 to 11. For this reason also God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Yes, he is worthy of honor indeed. The next term is glory, implied, of course, the glory of God. Once again, pointing out that, that the Lamb is God. He's defined, that is defined, that glory is defined as the very light of heaven. There is no flaw, no defect that could ever be found in the Lamb and in God. And all glory belongs to Him. Look, for example, in Psalm 29, 2, ascribe to the Lord the glory due to his name. Worship the Lord in holy array. <clears throat> and that is something that we should all do. Worship him in as a glorious, the glorious God that he is. But 
No, you're now in for a surprise because Jesus Christ has been given all glory, infinite glory by God the Father. And notice in John 17, 22, <coughs> what he does with it. The glory which you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one, just as we are one. Did you notice that? The glory which God the Father had given to Jesus Christ, God the Son, he has given to them. And to them in here, in the context, it means to the church, to us, to you. God has all glory. And yet, he wants to share that with you. The next term is blessing. God, of course, he deserves all blessing. For he is the giver of all life. And all blessings come from him and they all belong to him, and he's worthy of all of them and much more. Notice in First Thessalonians chapter five and verse eighteen, in everything give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Brethren, we, we tend to be like the Israelites many times and complain <clears throat> and, and gripe for the things that we don't have, and we neglect to to acknowledge and be grateful for the blessings that God has given us. But here we're talking about God, and we're talking about the fullness. We're talking about infinite um, in terms of what this blessing means. Can we even begin to, to comprehend that glory, the majesty of the Lamb? And yet, why is he called the Lamb? He's called the Lamb because he is the very one, the one who is worthy of such amazing and astonishing glory. He's the very one who was willing to make himself human for you. He was the same one who gave his life for you. That's why here he's referred to as the Lamb of God. Brethren, let's look at verses 13 and 14. And every created thing which is in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all things in them, I heard saying to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and dominion forever and ever. And the four living creatures kept saying, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped. The choir, praising the Lamb, now grows and expands to include every creature, every created being, every creature that is in heaven, on earth, under the earth, and on the sea, and all that it contains. All creation now joins in to acknowledge the infinite glory and the worth of God expressed in the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. All universe worships Him. This is a majestic picture of worship. All creation bowing down and acknowledging who Jesus Christ is and worshiping God and our Savior because He is worthy of that worship. He is worthy, as we will see, to step forward and take the book of destiny. He is worthy to rule and reign supreme over all history now and forevermore. All creation in fact, it's written in Scripture that all creation is unable to contain its joy because of its imminent redemption. A redemption that is brought about by God through, amazingly enough, the glory of those He has redeemed. You. You have a role in that. Let's read that in Romans chapter 8 
and verses 19 and 20 to 21. For the anxious longing of a creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. Now why does he wait eagerly for the sons of God? Because the creation itself also will be set free from its slavery to corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. Now, brethren, I don't know about you, but when I read it, even now, even today, I am tempted to, to, to read that creation will be set free from its slavery to corruption into the freedom of the glory of God. But that's not what is written. What is written is into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. And he's talking about you and your destiny in Christ. Your destiny because of the Lamb. What God has in store for us is not imaginary, brethren. It is real. He promises that he will share with us his infinite glory and majesty. Of course, we don't see the fullness of that yet, but one day we will. He granted us the amazing privilege of participating in his awesome plan to bring redemption to all of creation. And one day we will see the difference in all of creation. But for the time being, we see that he has actually started that already, granting us to be part of his church granting us to be part of the body of Christ, granting us the honor of participating in his work, bringing his peace and his redemption to others. Think of that as a tiny seed that is going to blossom into a majestic plant. Brethren, God has so much in store for you. Please listen to him. Respond to him, and may endless blessing, honor, praises, glory, and worship be to our triune God now and forever. Amen. God bless you. My heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest in hope because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead. You will not let your Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the paths of life, and you will fill me with joy in your presence. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, Lord, for you are my strength and my Redeemer. Amen. How great the chasm that lay between us How high the mountain I could not climb In desperation I turned to heaven And spoke your name Into the night And through the darkness Your loving kindness Tore through the shadows Of my soul is finished the end is written Jesus Christ my living hope who could imagine so great a mercy what heart could fathom such boundless grace the God of ages step down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame. The cross has spoken, I am forgiven. The King of kings calls me his own. Beautiful sin. Jesus Christ.
Seal the promise your buried body began to breathe out of the silence the roaring lion declared the grief has no claim on me then came the morning that sealed the promise so wonderfully created us and even more wonderfully restored us grants that we might participate in the divine life of him who humbled himself to share our humanity your son Jesus Christ who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit one God forever and ever amen <laughs> 